you have your Bibles with you, open them up please at Romans uh, chapter 1. As we read our Bibles, there's many questions that I believe are not fully answered. There are many questions we are faced in life. And the most important question we need to get right is, what is the gospel? As many of you know, I work in prison. And uh, I meet a lot of unsavory characters. And if I want to know where they are in their spiritual journey, I will say to them, in a sentence, tell me what the gospel is. And I get different answers. I don't ask them what the tulip is or uh, uh, what creation is or uh, what does election mean. I ask them what the gospel is. That's the most important. Remember what Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15? He said it's of first importance, the gospel. I remind you of the gospel. Now, I'm sure everybody here today knows what the gospel is, but I'm just going to remind you because it's so important. It's more important than anything else. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, Romans chapter 3. So going back to what I mentioned earlier, the question I ask all professing Christians in prison is, tell me in a sentence, what is the gospel? Some of the answers I get are quite, quite strange, actually. Uh, some of the questions, are, some of the answers are something like this. Uh, well, the gospel is like a, a textbook that tells us how we should live. Nothing about Jesus. Uh, others say it's just a book of fictional stories um, that help us live good lives. Others say it's just a, a, a man-written book. Well, if that's all the Bible is, or the gospel is, then uh, and that's what we believe. We believe in vain. I don't think it's just uh, in prison. I mean, I've asked Christians outside of prison who've been going to church for a long time, what is the gospel? And they can't answer me. I think it's really sad. If you've been going to church for 20-odd years and the question is, what is the gospel? That's what we put our faith in and you don't know what that is, then either you've not been listening very much or the teaching's very poor. Well, today, we're going to be looking at Romans 3, chapter 21, uh, sorry, verse 21 to 26. And before we do this, let's ask God to help us. Heavenly Father, you are a a merciful God, a God that loves us so much that you are willing to pour your anger out on Jesus Christ instead of us. And we just pray, Lord God, that we can grasp how sinful we really are and how merciful you are. And we ask all these things in and through our beloved Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Well, I don't know if you was listening to what David said earlier uh, in Romans, but it wasn't really a great picture of humankind, was it? There is no one righteous. In fact, if you, if you read it, it says, what shall we conclude then? So the Apostle Paul includes himself in all of this. He's as simple as anyone else. There is no one righteous, not even one. So let me just try and put this in context so you understand what's going on. The book of Romans were written to both Jews and Gentiles in Rome. They weren't getting on. A lot of people think that's why Paul wrote to them, but I don't believe it was. I think the reason he wrote to them is because he wanted them to understand the gospel. Because it says in 1 uh, Romans verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. That's why he was writing to them. Okay? But what he does is, in the first two chapters, is he wants both the Jews and the Gentiles to fully understand how sinful they are. Because if they don't understand how sinful they are, how can they understand how much God really loves them, has redeemed them? So if you have your Bibles with you, have a look at what it says at chapter 1, verses 16. Uh, Sorry, no, we won't go on to that. We'll go on to the next verse, verse 21. This is... Paul talking to the Gentiles. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images 
made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. In other words, the Gentiles were worshipping the creator, not the creator. And what would you have had by now is the Jews going, yes, give it to them. Give it to the Gentiles. They deserve it. But then have a look at what it says in verse 29. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity to love. Uh, sorry, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they knew God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. He's talking about the Jews here. But he's also talking about us. We could, all, we could read this and say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. We've come a long, long way now, but we haven't. We're in the part of that mix. We are part of that. We are sinful. It's not a very good picture, is it, of the Jew or the Gentile. But Paul wants to get one thing right before he gives them the gospel. He wants to make sure that there is absolutely no misunderstanding of who they are and how sinful they are. And I believe that's the same for us. We really need to know how sinful we are if we're to understand how much God loves us and how much he's put us in the right. Paul wants to make it crystal clear that both Jew and non-Jews are both in the same boat without a paddle. Both are under God's wrath. Neither Jew nor Gentile can free themselves from the bondage of sin. Notice how he starts uh, in verse 21. We've already made the charge that both Jew and Gentile are alike, are all under the power of sin. This is the first point I want us to understand, that we are all under God's wrath. Every one of us. No distinction. And we're all saved by God's grace. So if we're all under sin, that means there's no one beyond God's saving works. It doesn't matter how far you've gone away from God, there's no one who can have gone too far that God can't rescue And we're no better. See, we don't understand how sinful we are. We can't fully understand how much God loves us. And how much we need a saviour. There's no room for pride as Christians. Now, when we examine ourselves, we examine ourselves through a sinful lens. So we can tell ourselves that we're good. In fact, I go to prison... Often I'll speak to prisoners and they'll say to me, Tony, I've made one mistake, but I'm a good person. And I'll say, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not a good person. And I'll take them to this passage, there's no one good. I used to think I was good, but I'm not. None of us are good. See, when Paul sent this letter to Rome, in those days they wouldn't have read a particular passage. They'd have read the whole gospel of Romans, the whole lot. And so the Jews and Gentiles would have fully understood by chapters 1 and 2 that they're both in deep trouble. And that's what Paul wants them to do, to realise where they're at before he gives them this wonderful news. I mean, even the media tells us how good we are, don't they? You know, you hear stories about these heroic people who, you know, kill someone out of a burning fire. Or what about that uh, family who actually uh, leased their house or give a house to that family of uh, seven, I think there was a, a couple and five children who were homeless. And so they say, oh, they're good people. But they're only measuring how good they are by human standards, not by God's assessment. But here in Romans, Paul has made an assessment by God of how simple we really are. And God's assessment is fair and it's just. We are all under God's wrath every one of us so if you've come here today thinking you're a good person it's a wrong assessment you're not a good person none of us are 
Paul's assessment of all humans is, is very different to what we think. No one is righteous, not even one. All have fallen short of the glory of God. This should be very humbling as Christians because it helps us to understand. If we don't know how bad our sin is, how do we know how much God loves us to have been, been able to uh, fix the problem of sin? Now, I don't want to uh, depress you, but I just want us to all understand where we stand before God and our condition before I go on to tell us the gospel. I've heard this uh, particular sermon preached before on this passage, and I saw a woman actually get out of a chair and, and walk out of the church. She was absolutely fuming because the thought of an angry God, the thought of the fact that we deserve God's wrath, totally offended her. So I don't know where she was at, but she never stayed long enough to hear the gospel message, unfortunately. So please don't get out of your seats. Wait, because there's, there's good news to come. I just want us to have a fair assessment of who we are first. See, verse 22 makes it very clear, doesn't it? There is no difference between Jew, Jew and Gentile. All have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. Not some, but all. You know, uh, Simon said one day at uh, Bible study that uh, the most holiest of people is closer to Hitler, his character, than he is to God. And I think that's probably true. We just don't understand how holy God is. But if you listen to the passage David read earlier, you might think God was a bit harsh on Aaron's sons. You know, they just didn't follow quite right the procedure of what they should have done, what God had told them to. So God just blazes them, annihilates them. But what we've got to remember is they were the priesthood and they were representing Israel. And it gives us a glimmer of how holy God is. And because they didn't follow God's instruction, he just stabbed them like that. In fact, he even told Aaron and the others that they couldn't even mourn for them. Because God is a holy God. He's a righteous God. That is why God himself has to be the one who puts us right. We can't put ourselves right with God. Have a look at what it says at verse 21 onwards. But now, apart from the law, the right... To, sorry, this is chapter 3, verses 21. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. See, you notice where the righteousness comes from. Does it come from us? Where does the righteousness come from? It comes from God. What is righteousness, by the way? We see it a lot. I mean, when I saw righteousness, I think of something like being good. A righteousness, you know, being, living a good life. Righteousness... Is a fancy word, same as justification, both mean the same thing. Basically, God puts us right with him. Okay? God is the one who not only initiates it, but he's the one who does it. He's not only the object, but he's the subject. And that sounds a bit silly, but he's the one who sends the righteousness, and he's the one who becomes the righteousness for us. We are forgiven sinners. That's what justification means. We are not guilty. It's like, it's like going to court for something that you've done and the, and the judge saying you are not guilty, you are pardoned, even though you've done something wrong. That's what justification means. And it only happens once. So once God declares you not guilty, he can't then change his mind the next week and say, oh, you've messed up a little bit. I'll, you know, I'll change my mind. No, he doesn't make mistakes. Once you are right with God, you are always right with God. Okay? It's a wonderful doctrine. So God initiates the righteousness. The righteousness has to come from God. It can't come from us. Because remember, we can't keep the law. The law shows us our sin. It's God who puts us right. Now this is a bit funny, because if God is going to put us right with himself, who's going to punish the sin? See, I go to prison and I ask this question and none of the guys can answer it. And it's such a simple answer. But I'll say, if God is going to punish... Uh, sorry, if, if he's not going to punish us, how can he let us go free? 
and not punish sin. See, if he doesn't punish sin, surely he relaxes his justice. Yeah? It's a bit like this. It's a bit like, say David had a nice Ferrari car, right? Let me explain it this way. And I say to David, can I borrow your car? And then I just smash it up. And I come back and say, Dave, I'm really sorry. I've smashed your car up. Now, David could say, look, Tony, I love your brother. I'll pay for the damages. I'll get it fixed, right? So he forgives me, right? But the car is still in total write-off mode. He's still got to spend money to get that car fixed. And it's a bit like God saying to us, look, I'm going to forgive you of your sins. And that's what a lot of people believe. But they don't realise that if he's going to forgive us our sins, someone has to pay the penalty. And a lot of people don't know who it is. And I'm not going to tell you who it is just yet, but I'm sure you know. God can't just let us go free, pardon us, without someone paying the price. So God's righteousness, he can't just make us right with himself without punishing sin. Otherwise, he's relaxing his justice and he he ceases to become God. Yet, if God is going to remain as God, he has to punish sin. So how can we be put right with God? Well... If you look at your Bibles, you might have got the word atonement. Okay? Let me just read this passage out. I'll read read the full passage out. Uh, We're just going to look at chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. No difference. Between Jew and Gentile, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, and are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a propitiation through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Now you might have the word atonement. Uh, The NIV's got it wrong. Sorry? Justice. Justice, yeah. You might have different things. It's not not so much wrong, but atonement has different meanings. Okay, so atonement is used as a mercy seat, a covering. It can be used as substitution. You know, God took our place. A penalty. Penalty was paid. Uh, It could be used as redemption. There was a price paid. God, you know, Jesus paid that price. But here, uh, it's a word called propitiation. Does anyone know what it means? I can't even pronounce it, but does anyone know what it means? God's anger. See, a lot of people don't want to put this in the Bible. God's anger on his son. I mean, is, is God a father who just, you know, a a very cruel father to his son. They don't like that. God's anger had to be satisfied. He's angry with us. Angry. Now, what we've got to remember is God's anger is not like our anger. Now, I don't know if you've seen anyone who's anger or has had a rage or something, but it's, it's quite ugly. And it's not controllable, is it? Once they go off, that's it. They go off in a tangent. What do you reckon, Andrew? Yeah? But for God, his anger is measured, and it's right, and it's justified at anger. So, you know, when David read that passage about the two sons of Aaron, when he set fire on them, he was justifiably right in doing that. So God, anger, it's not here in this passage, his anger is poured out. Who's it poured out on, though? Because if it was poured out on us, none of us would be here today. There'd just be a burning fire, come straight down. No one should be here. And this is the last point that we're going to be looking at. For God's anger to be satisfied, he had to pour the anger on himself through Jesus Christ. Now, people might say, well, that's not fair, is it? You know, look, no one likes the father to pour his anger out on the son. And you might say, well, it wasn't God. It was the Jews. It was the Jews who crucified Jesus. Or you might say it was the Romans. But hold on a minute. What does Jesus say on the cross? Hello, hello, please, uh, why have you abandoned me? 
You know, Jesus says, God, why have you forsaken me? In fact, if you think about it, what did he, what did he say to Pilate? When Pilate said to him, I have the right to give you life and I have the right to take your life, he says, no, you haven't. Anything that you've been given has been given by my Father. So this was God, the Father's doing. Now let's be fair here. If you've got a son and you see your son in a lot of pain, who's, who's most in pain, you or, or the son? Father was not passive when Jesus went to the cross. He's not passive. He's suffering as well because he's seen his son suffer. But he knew that that was the only way that his anger could be satisfied, justice could be done, and for us to be not guilty. We're still sinners. We're not guilty sinners, though. We're declared not guilty because of Christ's righteousness and for him who's paid the price. This is incredible because what it is is we are in the wrong, but God puts us in the right. We're in the wrong, we are sinful, but God puts us in the right. John Stott, I think, puts it wonderfully. He says this, he says, that propitiation does not make God's graciousness, God does not love us because Christ died for us, Christ died for us because God loves us. <laughs> yes, God is angry and he hates sin, and it just shows us how much sin is offensive towards him when we see what Jesus had to go through. But he was without sin. It's our sin that went on his shoulders, isn't it? I think the other thing I just want to finish off with in this particular story is um, what happens to all those in the Old Testament? You know, how, how does it work with them? I mean, are, are they forgiven or not? Because, I mean, Jesus didn't die until after them. Do you know what I mean? Like, what about Adam and what about Moses and what about Abraham? I mean, are they in heaven or are they in hell? I mean, how do we know? Well, have a look what it says here. This is quite interesting. We're going to look at uh, verse 25 onwards. God presented Christ as a sacrifice or a propitiation through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So what we've got here is God has suspended his judgment on all those people who believed in God in the Old Testament. All right? He suspended it. He's chosen not to punish them as they deserve. And so when Jesus went to the cross... The punishment that he took, or God's anger, was not only for people after the cross, but it was always, always those before the cross as well. He just delayed his judgment. And we can't fully grasp God's judgment until the last day. And so my encouragement to you is, are you right with God? Not, have you done all these good things, but have you got a right relationship with God? Do you understand that Jesus Christ is the one who took the wrath of God in your place. And for me. This should be really encouraging as Christians. Because, especially as ministers. Because as ministers you can get burnt out. Because all you're trying to do is please the church. But if you're doing it out of the wrong motivation. You won't last the distance. But if you as a minister realise the gospel message. That it doesn't matter how much you do. It's not going to make God love you more or less. Because he loves you. Because Christ has took his anger. The father's anger then you can carry on doing God's work knowing that you are saved by his grace. The gospel is not faith, by the way. It says through faith. That's how we receive the gospel. The gospel is something that God has already done. He's achieved by Christ. Faith, so the gospel is the root. Faith is the fruit. We can't mix that up because if we get the fruit and the gospel mixed up, guess what? I'm doing good, that's the gospel. No, it's the fruit of the gospel, it's not the gospel. By me doing good for others and showing the fruits of the gospel just means that I've understood what God's done for me. Okay? You cannot be saved by faith alone. It's got to be faith in the right object, and that is Christ. Okay? So it doesn't matter how much good you want to do, unless it's placed in the right object, which is Christ, and unless your motivation for doing good is because of what Christ has already done for you, then your motives are wrong. So we all need to check our motives from time to time. Am I doing this because I want that other person to love me? Or am I doing it because God's already shown his love for me and I just want to please God by doing that? 
It's a difference, isn't it? So we're here today and we're reminded of this wonderful gospel message that Jesus took on our sins. Not only that, but he took on God the Father's anger so that we can be forgiven sinners. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we will never fully understand the depth of your love without fully understanding our sinfulness before you and how holy you are. Help us, Lord, to continue to grow in the love and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, be reminded of what he has done for us, what he's accomplished for us, and help us to be able to express our faith in good works, not because we're saved more or less, but because we've had a, a deep understanding of how much you've loved us from the beginning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.